right. Should I begin? So let's let's start the meetup. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kuraj. Uh, I'm gonna be kicking off this meetup. I see a lot of excitement, uh, a good vibe here. Um, so hopefully this content is gonna be useful for you. Uh, we have a lot of like good, um, I guess, fireside chat uh, planned up after this. Um, so my name is Kurosh. Uh, I'm part of the AnyScale team on the technical part of the AnyScale endpoint stack. Today I'm gonna, should I hold this? Can everyone hear me now? Is it good? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, some content that we have published today, which is more about how do we deal with context, limited context length uh, via fine-tuning language models. Uh, without, this, this talk is uh, essentially organized in a way that I don't dive too deep into the technical details of how the fine-tuning thing actually works. It's more about how to set up uh, a data set for doing such a thing and how to do evaluation so that we get um, essentially the, the things we want for our application development. So um, I don't know how much people are familiar with like these terminologies, uh, but essentially um, LLM applications, the successful ones, you can think about them um, as like their feet, they're starting to feed in uh, either of these patterns. So RAG systems, retrieval augmented generations, uh, is essentially refers to this uh, design pattern where you essentially hook up a knowledge base to your LLM and uh, when you're asking queries, the relevant documents and content are gathered um, as, and fed to an LLM so that it can essentially diffuse that information into a coherent response at the end. Um, and on the other side, uh, something that we are seeing a lot uh, these days is this uh, idea behind agents, which is uh, essentially hooking up LLMs to all these different tools uh, so that they can not only perceive the world, but uh, can also act on it and actually do some long-term uh, tasks independently. Um, so one of the pressing issues in building these systems is the limited context length of these language models. And naturally, this context length limitation puts an upper bound on the performance that you can get out of this. With more context length on rack systems, you can essentially fit more documents and let the LLM reason about what is relevant and what is not. And with agents, you can essentially feed, like um, enable your model to do more stuff with defining more tools and things like that. So in this talk, I wanna talk about how we can address the limited context length via fine tuning. And uh, I'm gonna focus on rack systems, but what I'll be covering here is kind of generalizable can think of it, um, you, you, you can essentially see and observe the same patterns in agent systems as well. Uh, but without getting to first, like before getting to fine tuning for context length, um, there are many benefits of doing fine tuning on open source models. So for RAC, uh, if you think about what, where would fine tuning help? There are like several dimensions you can think about. Um, if you think about like you're building these RAG applications for a final like domain specific thing usually, like there may be special terminologies involved, like you're building a financial statement analyzer or like a, something in the health space. Usually in these like domain specific um, applications, you have terminology that may not be, you know, apparent to um, the language model from its prior knowledge. For example, we build like RAG documentation, uh, RAG documentation, you know, assistant. Uh, usually, like, if this LM has never seen these RAG concepts, it never knows, like, what RAG means, right? It thinks it's like the fish, right? Um, so fine-tuning can sometimes help with map mapping what your essentially end, like, terminology is, and essentially teach uh, the model what those, um, like, specific terms are. And with RAG, you're ultimately looking at a grounded task, which means that you're not tr trying to create a new knowledge. Everything that the LM dot needs to do is like, is captured in the context that it's, uh, you're feeding it to. Um, so the problem about like hallucination is like uh, not so much relevant here. As, as long as 
uh, it doesn't go beyond like the context that is provided and it doesn't come up with answers that are not part of the context, it should be fine. So with fine tuning, you can essentially teach a model that given a context, you should just limit your knowledge base to this context. And if nothing is relevant, um, you can essentially teach it to do special answers like, hey, um, your answer to this query is not found or things like that. Um, most of the time, if you hook up like your the you know non-fine-tuned language models to the last stage of rack systems, they often tend to produce very long answers uh, unless you kind of uh, specifically prompt them to, to not do so. But with like open source language models, this kind of prompt engineering is a bit like harder than like you know, closed source models like OpenAI. And this is where, like, again, fine tuning can help. You can essentially teach the model to not produce those long answers and only uh, limit itself to short ones. Today, I'm going to talk about long context extension. That is something that we found that um, it's another dimension uh, of capability that you can add to your models um, that is a bit like, I guess, uh, not as, like, as emphasized in the community as the other ones. So today, uh, today's meetup is about like this topic of needle in haystack. I'm pretty sure the next speakers are going to have enough coverage on it, but this is kind of needed for the premise of the kind of next slides. So this is a, a very good uh, evaluation framework to think about when you want to evaluate whether an LM has like uh, equal understanding across all of its contexts. So. I love that picture. Uh, basically, it shows the problem in a high level view. Like, you're essentially hiding um, a desired you know, fact within like, a lot of noisy uh, things around it, like called needle in haystack, right? And you ask your LLM to kind of retrieve that fact um, without explicitly knowing where that fact is. You ask a question of, like, where is the apple? And it says, like, I see one apple or something like that. And uh, basically, the end result, um, you know, after you do your evaluation, is something like this graph, where you have two axes. Um, on the y-axis, you are essentially measuring like the depth at which this fact is injected, and you're sweeping that um, across the board. And then the y -axis, on, on the x-axis, you're sweeping the context length, the context of the haystack, how much noise are around that fact. Um, and then you evaluate uh, some sort of retrieval score or accuracy level, whether um, the desired fact has been like retrieved when the LM sees this context. And uh, I'm pretty sure Greg is going to cover the details here. But um, what we did here was we took like the original like benchmark is essentially uses Paul Graham's essays as haystack, um, very like uh, large textual corpus. And then it injects some fact like what is the best, like the best thing to do in SF is like to eat sandwich or something. And then it asks like the language model, what is the best thing to do in SF? And it has to respond, hey, sand, eating sandwich at like I guess dollar park or something is the um, best thing to do. And uh, when, we, when we tried this benchmark on like open source models like Mixtral, they solved it. Essentially, like so, there was not much to um, kind of like you know um, focus on around fine tuning. So we started adding a little bit of spice to the problem, so that it makes it more realistic um, to to the scenarios that could happen in real world as well. So in RAG applications, you may also have like this problem of like, hey, I have like bunch of documents that I retrieved. Some of them are relevant to this question, some of them are not, and I have to be able to kind of filter them out and like fuse them into a coherent answer. So the first thing that we noticed with this benchmark was that uh, the model could already have prior knowledge about what is the best thing to do in San Francisco. So even without like context, um, the likelihood that it says eating sandwich is non like zero, right? Um, so we wanted to explicitly make it harder for the model to kind of like get prone to this hallucination regime. So in order to do that, uh, we changed the kind of like the problem domain to retrieving biographies. Where um, within these biographies, we're talking about fictitious characters. They don't exist in the real world. And we were asking questions about, who is this person? Um, and then the LLM should essentially respond, hey, this person is this guy. Um, but this kind of modification of the problem forces the LLM to hallucinate if it doesn't work correctly. 
and you can essentially easily see, very quickly see how the model is performing. Another um, thing we noticed with the original problem was the needle kind of stands out. Uh, you're, like the haystack is essentially a bunch of, you know, startup ideas, like uh, th those kind of essays that talks about like business plans and et cetera. And then you're suddenly asking like, what the best thing to do in San Francisco is eating a sandwich. So it's, it's an outlier. Um, and this may be easier for LMs to kind of distinguish from the surrounding um, kind of context, and we wanted to make it harder. So for the needle, we use the same biography. It's still you're still retrieving a biography, but it's like from a dead, like a, I guess, individual that you have um, in mind. So it's kind of like this. You go from something being too obvious to something that is like hidden, and um, it's harder to kind of like get out. Another thing uh, about the benchmark is that the answer that you want is usually copy-pasteable. Like, um, the language model doesn't have to do a lot of like, higher-level reasoning. All it has to do is like, just copy-paste that fact uh, with some paraphrase. And we wanted to essentially see if the model can also reason across this thing. So uh, we kind of did a little bit of trick. So for example, like for dates, where this guy is born on like March 10th. We want the output of like the birth date to be on that particular format, right? Like, uh, like more, it had, the language model should learn that March maps to the third month in the year. So it has to do this like sort of higher level reasoning uh, to be able to fully solve the tasks. And you, when you're doing this benchmarking and like data set curation, you're effectively evaluating whether the model can do this type of things at large context as well. And um, last thing, which is, I think, very critical when you're developing LM applications is, like, how do you evaluate your models, right? Like, um, there's this whole concept of using GPT-4 as a judge that is kind of almost everywhere. That's kind of the easiest solution. But, like, sometimes with a little bit of changing your problem statement, you can, um, like, change your evaluation criteria to be non like not too hard that you need to rely on a, like another language model so for this to give you a concrete example uh, we force we want the output of the model to follow a specific json format representing the information within that biography um, so something like this like what is the nationality of this guy there is a bunch of like uh like neutral choices american like i don't know 100 choices uh, date of birth there's a certain structure to it. Like, uh, is this guy a sportsman or not? It's a Boolean, right? A uh, politician or not, there's a Boolean. So if we have this sort of like output structure, I don't need a language model as a judge. I can very quickly uh, write a Python script that checks for equality of the response to the expected format. And this basically solves like a lot of like, when you're doing iteration on the problem, you want something like this framework where you can quickly evaluate and iterate. And uh, putting a structure on your problem where you can uh, easily like just check for equality is one way to go about this. And you may ask, okay, how did you generate these data points? Um, so there is like a lot of tricks you can play. You can actually use LLMs to generate this stuff. Um, and we also like, we basically did this experiment with like, uh, even like less capable models, like on, on a lower end, like Mistral 7 e model, which is a very tiny one, people are running on their laptops these days, uh, with a constraint generation mode activated. Uh, this is basically available on any scale endpoints. It's an API call. You can kind of like feed these snippets of uh, biographies to the model and ask it to produce this format out of it. And uh, you collect, you run it essentially across a lot of data points and you collect this data set. Then you can essentially filter through them with manual like intervention sometimes um, to kind of like remove the the noise, the noisy ones, things like that don't fit the structure really well. So with that said, um, we constructed a data set for both training and test. Um, and uh, some of these kind of like results are just you know without fine tuning, meaning that you know actually just running the model on these test sets. And on the kind of the chart over there, uh, what we're seeing is like the average accuracy of retrieval across these different context lengths. And we have a few baselines. So 
as I said earlier, like mixture on the right, like on the original problem, like the without all of these like um, kind of spices we added, sort of solves the problem. It's always like almost 100% accurate across the board. But with this, you know, test data data set that we created, it's hovering around like 65-ish percent. And uh, despite being trained for like this to support 32K, it cannot solve this problem out of the box. And on the other hand, we have like a two other non fine tuned models which on the closed source side. So we have GPT 3.5 uh, 16K, which has a you know uh, degradation in performance and retrieval score as you increase the context length. Uh, but like for very like short context like 4K, it's almost like 99, 98% accurate. But as you increase the context line, it kind of tapers off. Um, the other two things, so these, these two baselines are the things that we don't train. You just test the LM capability on um, the kind of the test set, like on uh, the thousand examples that we had. Um, we then took these data sets and trained like a GPT 3.5 Turbo on them. And then saw that GPT 3.5, after training on this data set, can fully you know, solve this task. It as good as GPT 4, uh, which supports up to 128K. Uh, and we wanted to make kind of the same story happen for, I guess, like open source models, especially for models that don't even support up to 16K. So here, uh, for our kind of like uh, kind of trial, we, did, we focused on Llama 2 13B, which is natively trained up to 4K. I wanted to see after fine tuning the any scaling points on you know, these data sets that uh, is kind of proven to be good because GPT 3.5 after fine tuning kind of like nails the task. We wanted to see like how much we can improve uh, the accuracy. I, I mean, the beginning accuracy of the, the Llama is way below like the mixed roll one. It's less capable. But then after fine tuning on this specific data, you can get actually a better result than GPT 3.5 without fine tuning. And it's kind of like up to 8K. It's very close to even closed source models in its performance. Um, so if you take a closer look at you know, uh, this, this heat map chart, you can see that um, on the higher end of context length, there is this uh, kind of phenomena of lost in the middle present, which means that your language model um, perfectly kind of retrieves the needle that is towards the end and kind of uh, in the very beginning, but it, it tends to forget the stuff when they're like in the middle. And that still pertains here, like uh, this is not solved via, via fine tuning, but the fact that this Lama 213B was originally trained on like 4K, and then you can get this, this type of performance out of fine tuning um, is kind of very, very interesting. Um, more interesting than the performance is like the amount of money that you have to pay to actually get these results, right? Um, so mixed draw, like this is basically showing how much time we have to spend on like training costs for like 5,000 examples, and then how much money you have to spend for querying like across 16K context length for 1,000 queries. And uh, mixed draw is a, and like GPT 3.5, end up being on the inference side, almost like 2x more expensive than the Llama 2 13B after you fine tune it. But these, these numbers are essentially coming from like the token-based pricing on any scale endpoints. And uh, for the other providers like OpenAI, we get it from their website. Um, and like, yeah, let me show this, these two. So it's 2x um, kind of cheaper than the other things. And it's almost like, 10x cheaper than when you do fine tuning with OpenAI. Um, and I guess GPT-4 is out of question. No one can really go into production uh, with that type of cost, right? Um, but what is interesting is like, of course, you're kind of doing a trade-off between quality and cost, but the question is, how do you balance it, right? And for different applications, that answer is different. And you gotta try like these things to see where the trade-off is and like whether you can get away with like open source models, fine tune on your like specific domain, but the end result is like you pay a little bit upfront on training cost iterations and then um, 
during deployment, going to production, you can issue it, like save a ton. Yeah, so we have put out, the, I guess, the detail of this blog post out this morning. You can check it out. Uh, but in conclusion, I think I covered, uh, without diving too deep about like how we actually do this fine tuning, um, it's part of like the any scale endpoint feature. You can actually like uh, try it out. Like here, you can upload your data set very quickly and be fine tuned with the right context length on your model. But what you have to focus on is essentially creating these data sets and setting up your evaluation framework. So I just showcased what we did for this kind of needle in haystack problem in the rack context and how we created the synthetic data. Um, and how you can effectively achieve longer context length via fine tuning and made an economical like case study for why going for open source models fine tune is like a long term beneficial. Yeah. Um, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Cool. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Yeah. So, microphone. Any questions from the audience? So, how did you populate to the to extend the whole content yield? How did it with what? Like, uh, the content list is very huge. So, how do you feel feel that? Yeah. So, you know, good question. So, um, when we basically what we did was. We went through a lot of like biographies, right? And then mapped them to, I guess, their output, desired output. So you imagine you have 5,000 pairs of biographies and the desired output structure. Now what you can do is like mix them. You take one needle, like as a needle, you randomly sample one as a needle and sample, I don't know, a few thousand for haystack. And then you sweep where that needle is. And that's how we construct the data. So you basically, you end up with like a lot of examples that are have like one needle at different locations. You have a question about who is this guy, and then you get an output. So the data there's no data set limitation essentially by doing it once. So there's no no no, no like the techniques to cut it uh, the, every every needle you pull. No, yeah. Basically you pick rent like bunch you have a set of biographies and then you pick them as needle and then the other ones as a stack. And yeah, like the, there is no explicit constraint to treat them equally. Hi, there's good. a bunch of questions here as well. Go ahead. Hello, good evening. Hi, how are you doing? I wanted to ask about fine tuning for different languages outside of English. How is it possible to get the models as a user to understand languages that it's not really familiar with? Mm, good question. Um, I think fine tuning for understanding a new language, you, you would, I wouldn't call it fine tuning anymore. I think like you need enough data representing that language, like the structure, the syntax in that language, um, to be able to train this model. And like, uh, of course, like I think pre-training a model helps, but um, you know, like it is more, it requires more than fine tuning to kind of uh, tailor the model towards that language, right? So um, there's a lot of like languages that have essentially are a remap between different words to English. Those things can essentially you get a bit less amount of data to train on, but there would be languages that are totally structurally different, like I don't know Arabic and English, right? One starts from right to left, right? Um, that the concepts could still exist, but you need to have those languages present your pre-training data when these models were built. Otherwise, I don't think there's any hope to kind of fine tune them. Yeah. So that one has been trained on those languages. So yeah, like the training data set that they had probably had all, like all of this. Like there is like this, uh, you know, Mixtral, for example, um, that it doesn't really work on like languages like Farsi or Arabic. Like GPT-4 just does it very well. So it means that the pre-training data does, didn't have enough coverage of these data distributions. Yeah. There's a lot of questions here. Um, so if I understand this correctly, a needle is one distinct piece of information, right, in that whole data set. 
but in reality, like we have also seen data sets might have a lot of these distinct needles. So will the evaluation change or the yeah. results change if that happens? Yeah, so if there are cases that you're thinking about where you need to fuse multiple information from multiple you know, uh, information sources to a coherent answer, then you have to think about, okay, I have to add like, when, when I'm constructing this data, I need to actually put two needles. And maybe it's the same guy, or like maybe they're somehow connected. And then I ask uh, the language model like some question that relates to those two together. So you have to think about that problem from that perspective and construct the same, like similarly construct the data set and things like that, right? Um, so I would imagine like if I want to continue this you know, effort on to address that, it would be like, um, hey, like the same biography from like the same person, but like in um, two two different like distinct paragraphs, and then I would ask the same question about that person. Um, that would require like understanding of like you know like when is this guy born and like when he died, right? One piece of information is here, and then another piece of information is there, and I can evaluate that um, because I know the ground truth. Um, yeah, during data set construction. Yeah. Hi, nice talk. Thank you for comparing the performance and the cost. Yeah. It's very delighting and very straightforward. Uh, I have two questions. One is come to, you mentioned uh, synthetic data, and that's of a lot of pain point for many domains like finance or healthcare. If you're specifically giving an uh, example that like the birthday and year, those are pretty confidential you know, in some field. Uh, so if I understand correctly, as the user, we upload the data. Could be a partial data, incomplete data, unconstruct data, unclean, un like, and oh, no. fit into the system, which is any scale system. And so you guys provide the, um, the rest, right? And which is linked to the second questions. When it comes to model com comparisons, you automatically to uh, select the, the most high performance or most relevant models to fit into customer's need. Is yeah. that correct? And, so, and, and would, it, would it be fascinating if a um, Google Gemini model comparison would be in crude too. Yeah. What was that last part? Yeah, the Google Gemini. Yeah, yeah. but what, how, how does that fit into? Oh, uh, actually, uh, folks, I know he's here. He, I will help you to introduce to him to talk about more. Yeah, let, me, let me answer the question about the sure. uh, yeah, like the fine tuning product we have is like uh, you feed in your data and there are like these metrics loss, you know, and evaluation loss and things like that that we kind of monitor along the way and we pick like the, if you provide a validation data set, we pick the checkpoint essentially that has the minimum loss on the validation data set. And if you specify a different criteria like number of epochs or something like that, we kind of like uh, use that as a stopping criteria. But the end result is like you get a checkpoint and it's already getting served. You can start querying it using OpenAI compatible API and uh, essentially run your evaluation. So in other words, we are taking the pain of like dealing with infrastructure and like setting up your training scripts away. You just focus on your data set curation and evaluation pipeline. Okay, so also one of the pain points I want to follow up. That's great, thank you for answering that. Um, let's say a company usually have a lot of legacy uh, database, like several of them. You name like better database, I would say Pinecoin or some sort of. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's say let's say there's so many legacy data restored from those. And you mentioned Lambda and something in one of the graphs that how, how are you gonna be, are you gonna is assist in the data uh, transformation, migration, I mean. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so Basically, like those are application layer logic. We care about, we take care of the infrastructure parts, right? So Pinecone, of course, they scale things, right? Like vector databases. Um, we kind of like have integration points with some of them, Pinecone being one of them. But these are mostly like things that fall into the platform solution. Like what I've covered is like the public endpoint API product, similar to OpenAI, but for open source models. Um, so all the integration happens at the client side, like on the application layer. But of course, like if you hit a scaling need, like any scale essentially provides the next steps. Like Pinecone, like you move on to platform, like there's Pinecone integration, things like that, that can help scale up your application for your needs. Okay. 
I see the same yeah. corner step. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, have you considered running the needle in a haystack evaluation against, say, like structure data? Like, for example, the specific use case that I'm thinking about is like if you're looking at actions based agents who are using code as execution actions based agents and you're giving it like a large structured data of like API documentation, for example, like how well does it do in identifying what like APIs are needed to? Yeah, we succeed? haven't tested yeah. that. I think that's a good case of study to kind of extend the needle in haystack. Yeah. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, I, I thought the depth of the context was really interesting. Could you talk more about, like, are there ways to get around lose like less accuracy when the needle's in the middle of the, uh, the like the documents versus at the beginning or the end, or is that just a general problem with LLMs? Yeah, I guess like different LLMs show different behaviors. Uh, like this kind of phenomena exists also in GPT-4. Uh, Greg, I guess, is, I haven't seen Greg, but like, he's gonna talk about uh, the what he observed from GPT-4 128K. It happens at, at like a certain, after a certain context length. Um, Mixtral, for example, shows it differently. Anthropic shows it differently. But like, there is definitely these knowledge gaps. Like, there is like, I don't know, we can call it like uh, forgetting or something like that, right? Where at certain context lengths, uh, the model just like doesn't pay attention to that, and I, no one essentially knows why. Like maybe um, it's part of the training process. Um, some of these models have different implementation of attention. Maybe it's an artifact of that. Things like this. But um, for Llama specifically, this was also present. Um, this is probably like because of some architectural level details of like how attention is implemented for these language models, and that's basically shared. Everyone is using the same architecture. There's no magic there, and that's why you see. So, like, so if you don't see this behavior, it's probably like um, those models either have some data, like some figure out some like training procedure to not have that, or they have changed their architecture in some way. Yeah. Uh, a question over here. Like, really good talk. Thank you for that. Um, is there anything available in the open source ecosystem that'll help you approximate? how much data you need for a particular fine-tuning task, and then also, what's it gonna cost you to fine-tune? Mm. Good feature ask request. <laughs> um, I don't think, yeah, I haven't seen anything. Uh, my mental model when developing these things is like you gotta start with small amounts of data, and, and you gotta mostly like think about your problem, right? Like. Um, Sometimes I start with even like prompt engineering and I see how far I can get, like if my task actually um, meets that criteria. Like this is clearly like, you can never prompt a model and you gotta try like your best. Like it's hard to prompt a model to output a certain structure like this, right? There's a lot of, if this happened, do this, don't do that. Like a lot of like, please don't output something else, right? Um, and this demands for fine tuning. Like this is perfect case for fine tuning. And I would start with like small data sets because th th that's the money I'm spending. But you shouldn't over index on the cost you spend on training because that's insignificant compared to what you would pay for inference. And you kind of do that analysis to yourself. Like how much time should I spend on like doing these iterations versus I can essentially start with the largest data set possible and like try it out, see if it works. Also, it depends on how hard it is to collect data from your domain. If it's like something that can be scripted, used other models to do this for you, right? And then you do some human curation on top. Usually these are scalable methods. I would say like start with the largest data that you can. But if it's like harder, uh, I would like start smaller and go from there. Yeah, it's hard to think about a tool to do this thing automatically essentially. Right. Uh, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Oh, there's two. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So the, uh, uh, I was wondering about the uh, impact of the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the policy that you would use for fine tuning. For example, like let's say that you know, like you choose to fine tune the the early layers versus uh, the uh, the, uh, the final layers, and also how would you avoid like overfitting? Yeah. Let's yeah. say that if you have uh, like a, a small data set, how would you make sure that you are not overfitting? Yeah. That? So we use low rank adapters 
as the fine tuning mechanism, which means you're fine tuning every layer, but you're fine tuning uh, kind of like a, a, a yeah, a low rank, essentially like a extra parameters on top of each layer, um, so that the whole like you kind of modify the activations as they go through. But the, this thing, this method, has a self-regularization. Like you're not changing the model too much by its definition. So it's kind of like very prone to that kind of overfitting um, kind of case you mentioned. And yeah, this is kind of a pretty much a standard fine-tuning mechanism. Like low rank adapters, there are variations of it, of course, but like uh, we have like our custom version here, um, which kind of pretty much works across the board. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, there is a question here. That <laughs> Where is the? Yeah. Can you? Uh, all right, that's the last, last question. One. All right. Yeah. Uh, if you could go back like a slide, I noticed you have the chart that like this one. Um, so you mentioned that fine tuning Llama 2 helps it do better and come closer to 3.5. Um, I noticed in the code you ran Llama 2, like the base model, but you didn't plot it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how did it perform? Yeah, it's basically around like 50 percent ish. Um, yeah, we should probably add it or something. Yeah, but yeah. Mixtral like is perceived as the best open source model, and we wanted to see how far that goes. Um, you know, Llama 2, of course, is going to be lower, but like um, Mixtral is kind of the the king in the house. So we wanted to evaluate that. That's an upper bound, and wanted to show okay, we beat that. Not only that, but also GBD 2.5. Do you offer Mixtral fine tuning? Would so, you rerun it with mixed fine tuning if you so, do? Yeah, got it. Cool. Yeah. All right. I think uh, yeah, that's last it. Last question was it? Yep. Cool. Let me stop sharing here. All right. Next, we have um, Greg up here. Beautiful. My name is Greg, and today we're going to be talking about the origin story behind the needle in a haystack analysis. Because this all started with a question, how good are LLMs at reasoning over simple facts over a long context? So imagine this. I didn't get into OpenAI's dev day. Right? I'm guessing a lot of all of us did it, but that's OK. So I actually partnered with the GP, which is a VC firm up in North Beach. And we decided, well, we're probably not the only ones. Let's throw a watch party for people, right? And so I'm sitting there. And then all of a sudden, I hear Sam start to say, GPT-4 Turbo supports up to 128,000 tokens of context. That's 300 pages of a standard book. You'll notice that the model is much more accurate over a long context. Hmm, interesting. But before we talk about Sam, first, again, my name is Greg. I um, help businesses figure out how they're actually going to deliver customer value with AI. And that sounds pretty markety, but stats are cool, models are cool, but I really want to know, like, how are end users actually going to get value from these language model capabilities we're seeing here, all right? So let's get back to Sam. So 300 pages, that is quite a lot. That's a whole book that he says. And for all of my diffuser friends, diffusion friends out there, that's a whole book, all right? So I'm wondering the same thing that everyone else is wondering. And so I look inside my third eye, my LLM eye, and I wonder, what is performance like, though? Sure, we have 128,000 uh, tokens, but what's performance like, all right? So I decided I want to do a simple test, right? I'm a simple person. I need something really, really easy. 
I don't want any reasoning. I don't want any multi-hops. I don't want any agents. I don't want any of that stuff. I just want, can it pull a simple fact from a piece of context, right? So what I do is I go get one of Paul Graham's essays, because that seems to be the training material for all AI tutorial examples, <laughs> right? And I put a, um, a statement which I think is going to be unique in there, right? The best thing to do in San Francisco is eat a sandwich and sit in Dolores Park on a sunny day. And why did I choose this? Well, because I used to go to Ike's and go to Dolores Park and then go get a sandwich. I wanted to put a picture of this Ike's on here, but it turns out it closed. So that's how you know you're getting older when your favorite spots start to close down a little bit more. But either way, so what we did was is we take that 1K token of context and we turn it into a prompt. So we have our context on the left and we have our question on the right, our query. What is the best thing to do in San Francisco? Does the model get it? Well, it says, yeah, the best thing to do in San Francisco is eat a sandwich, Dolores Park, Sunday day. Okay, whatever, cool. It gets it. That's pretty awesome. Now, we go to the other side. What will it do with 128,000 tokens of context? We ask it the same thing. We put in the same fact, we ask the same question, and we throw it in there. And it says, I'm sorry. The text does not say anything about what the best thing to do in San Francisco is. Hmm. That's interesting. And I should have said something about myself earlier, but I have a background in growth and product analytics, and so I'm a data guy, right? I, I, think, in, I think in spreadsheets, I think in gradients. And so my next question is, where does it break down? Because we know that 1K is good to go. We know that 128K isn't good to go. So where does it break down in the middle, right? That's the question that I had. And as a data person, it's like, well, let's just go gather some data points and let's go figure it out, right? But then I thought to myself, wait, wait a minute. There's that one lost in the middle paper. And for those who aren't familiar with this lost in the middle paper, it was a pretty cool one that came out. And it said that facts in the middle of a long context are recalled with less accuracy than facts on the, the front end or the tail end. And like any well-constructed abstract, they said that exactly in the front. And they said, we find that performance can degrade significantly when changing the position of relevant information. Interesting. So now we have a two axi thing going on. We have context length and we have where the heck it is in the document. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, I should have said a, a second thing about data people like myself is I constantly have the D3 example gallery floating through my head. These data visualizations, whenever I need inspiration, I just go right to the D3 gallery and I go check it out to see if anything sparks some interest for me. And so I thought to myself, okay, well now we have two things. We have an X and Y grid, but then we want to measure performance too. Did it actually recall the fact or did it not? Did it, half, did it uh, call the fact uh, with a 50% accuracy maybe? I don't know, but let's, let's go find out. Let's go check it out. And so what I did was is I wrote up a little script. The code doesn't matter here. What matters is that I took my finger, I placed it over cursor's big red play button it's not red, but big, big button there. And we started and we kicked it off. And so I wanted to find out where did the model start to break down. And as I started to run this test, what we did, my very first data point, is I started down at the bottom left. And for those in the back, if you can't see this, I'm sorry. We started at 1K and we started by placing the fact at the very bottom. So literally the last sentence in this prompt. And we said, hey, what's the best thing to do in San Francisco? They got it. And so green means good and it means that it was able to um, accurately, accurately retrieve the fact. So as we started doing it, it started coming through, it started coming through, and then all of a sudden, we have a bunch of greens for 1K and we have to let the rest of the thing run. Now, we'll skip to the end and we'll do without the dramatic effect, but what came out the other end was a visualization that I put together in uh, Google Slides, and I called it pressure testing GPT-4 128K via needle and haystack because you're placing the random fact in there. Now, we could talk about this and go really, really deep. I'm only just gonna say two things here I think are interesting. You'll notice all of the green context until the middle. That means that it, was ac it could accurately retrieve the fact that I asked it to up until uh, 64,000 tokens of context. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty cool. Now, of course, is this the most rigorous thing in the world? Is it bulletproof? Absolutely not. But the fact that it was able to do this across all these data points um, shows, hey, yes, there is some promise here. Now, on the second half, as expected, the longer the context, the less accuracy you get. But was it, what was interesting to me is it was the top half of the document. 
that had poor performance. But not just any part of the top half of the document. The very top part, you'll notice it's all 100% uh, across the top. That means if the fact was the first thing in, this, in the essay, it got it 100% of the time. But the minute that it started to creep down a little bit, well, that's when it started to get a problem. All right? Um, this isn't, we're going to talk more about this in a second here, so I won't go too far deep into it. But either way, I got those results and I thought, hmm, pretty cool. Do people get the Sam meme? Okay, good. <laughs> it's not directly applicable because we're not killing startups here, but I thought that was a funny one. Um, either way, I go to Twitter and I think, well, I need to publish these results. And so, no, I'm not doing a white paper. No, I'm not doing a blog post. I'm, again, I'm a simple person. So I wrote this up on Twitter here and I did a good long thread. I tried to explain myself and packaged it up. And before I sent it out, I was like, man, I really better get a stats friend to come give me some help on this. So I DM'd Charles and I said, hey, Charles, can you give me some thoughts on this? And he goes, well, Greg, I would have done a few things differently, but generally, I'm gonna give you thumbs up on this analysis. I said, cool, that's great. So again, I take my big finger and I put it on the post button of Twitter and out the other end, some really cool people started to recognize the analysis. The needle in the haystack analysis. Some people liked it. Some people asked if they could donate. Some people weren't fans. That's okay. You're not going to please everybody. Um, my favorite response that came from the Twitter side was somebody who posted the Will Smith iRobot meme. So Will Smith says, you're saying you can't even perfectly recall 128,000 tokens? The robot says, can you? <laughs> and Will Smith in shambles. <laughs> Yeah, that was my favorite response. Um, but what was cool is this went out, I think it was in November at some time, and then you get a DM from Anthropic. And they say, hey, Greg, we want you to do this for us. And I said, cool. They were open to sponsoring it, but I didn't want them to influence the results at all. So I said, hey, I'm going to run this. You're not just going to use me for the microphone or anything like that. And they're like, no, that's totally fine. That's totally cool. Um, the other thing I should have said about data per people, and this is the th third and final thing I'll say about data people, they always want more data. So I paid for this OpenAI GPT-4 test. This was out of my own pocket. I was comfortable spending the couple hundred bucks that it took to go do it. But if Anthropic's paying, <laughs> I'm gonna crank it up a little bit. So I did a 15 by 15 beforehand, so that's 225 data points. For Anthropic, we did a 35 by 35. And so that was about five and a half times as much data. And then we do the same test for them. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't as positive for Anthropic right out the gate. And again, I put this on Twitter, it went out, and it started to get a little bit of publicity, and some people started to rag on Anthropic, and um, that's not what we want. We're all on the same team here. We want cool LLMs, we want cool value for customers, right? And so we want to support each other through this. And so Anthropic ended up posting a response blog post to this analysis. And they did their own analysis with their own heat map, and it was much different, right? There's a lot more green on this. Um, <laughs> no, but really. And so the, the next natural question, which I asked to, which they were, they've been a fabulous throughout this entire process. The next natural question is, how did you get so much green? Like, what, what, what happened with it, right? And so um, they gave a few more prompt engineering tips for working with Claude that I was not applying that open uh, GPT-4 uh, wasn't applicable towards, right? And so what they said in their blog post, um, and I know in the back here that the screen's a little low, I'll, uh, I'll skip right to the point. When they end their prompt, I ended it with what I had on the left, which was assistant colon, because that's what they wanted me to end it with, meaning, hey, assistant, time to do your job, go do it, right? They added the words on the right, and the words are assistant, Here's the most relevant sentence in the context. So I was thinking about how to describe this and how I think about it before this. It's kind of like they're on the top of the mountain and they gave the language model just a little push to get it started rolling down. So I think that there's a good discussion on whether or not this is overfitting a prompt for a specific task at hand, but that's outside the scope of this conversation. Either way, there is much better results with this. And I also think it's another lesson in prompt engineering that if you adjust your prompts in this case, by eight words or something like that, you get drastically different results. So keep exploring on the prompts. Um, either way, uh, what's cool is this analysis, it starts to live on without me. And so some people ask, hey, Greg, do you mind if I fork the code? It's like, hey, I have 
it's out of my hands at this point. Go and run with it. It's like a living thing at this time. So it'll get shared on Twitter. I'll see the visualization, and I'll think, oh, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, and then Arise uh, sent me an email. They said, hey, Greg, we love it. We want to take this to the next level. And I said, go for it. I absolutely love it. And so all the work that Arise is doing has been really, really awesome to see how they've uh, increased the rigor of the test and how they're really um, publishing more results and really promoting LLM evaluation, which is all fun. So thank you for listening to the backstory behind the needle in this analysis. Wow. So, uh, so we're going to do a, a fireside chat first. And if, if any of you want to see the actual results, we try to reproduce Anthropic's results. We'll show that after in the next set of research. So, cool. Is this echoing? Can you? Cool. Awesome. How's everyone doing? So, uh, so, so I'm Jason, uh, CEO, founder of Arise. We're thinking of us as like a data dog for, for AI, kind of observability evaluation for, for AI. Hey, I'm Robert, um, one of the co-founders and CEO of AnyScale. So we are an AI infrastructure company. So we help companies, businesses um, scale AI workloads like training, inference, embedding computations across a bunch of GPUs or a bunch of compute resources. Cool. Uh, let's just start off with um, maybe, maybe just a show of hands. How many of you have tested or used Nextral or Mistral models? Wow. Okay. I was expecting more. Uh, how, how many of you uh, like don't know what Mistral or Mistral models are? Is anyone daring to raise their hand? Uh, cool. Um, Robert, why don't, you, why don't you start off? I, I feel like that's those are kind of one of the hot or at least the hot thing of, over the last, um, yeah, yeah uh, last bit. Can you describe Mistral versus Mixtral and? Sure. Uh, yeah. So, well, one of the you know big stories in 2023 was the trajectory of open source LLMs. Right? I think at the beginning of 2023, um, the best open source LLMs were not that good, right? And were not really usable in real applications, and. That completely changed by the end of 2023. So you had, um, you know, the Meta team, the Llama team at Meta release Llama 2, which was a step function above all other open source LLMs up to that point. Um, they had the, you know, seven, they re released a few different Llama 2 models in different sizes. Um, and later that year, later last year, um, this, this uh, Mistral company, which is a small AI startup in France, released, well, actually, they released a couple different models. So they first released their small Mistral 7 billion parameter model, which was um, you know, better than any other 7 billion parameter model. It's like super small, super fast. And uh, that quickly led to a few fine-tuned variants of the Mistral-based model, which were you know, even better. Uh, but what happened toward the end of last year was that they released a slightly larger a uh, mixture of experts model called Mixtral. So it's, the company name is Mistral, and they called the model Mixtral because it's a mixture of experts, so just kind of a, uh, a cute name. And this is really the first open source model that started to, uh, people are saying, is as good as GPT 3.5 and, um, you know, is, is uh, starting to really erode the lead that proprietary models like, you know, OpenAI have. Yeah. So this is one of the big develops in developments in open source models. The companies, you know, both uh, Meta and, <coughs> and Mistral are, have plans or are claiming that they're going to release GPT-4 quality models in, in 2024. So there's a lot to look forward to there. Yeah, we, we, we run a, an immense number of evaluations, both model level and kind of task level. Um, and I would say uh, open source models have, have under, 
underperformed uh, uh, not to date and, and had not stood out to us. Um, the the eight, you know, eight by seven B, the, the mixed role model is one of those that like has surprised us at every turn. Um, one area we, you know, we've done some evaluations on specific tasks or specific types of benchmarks. And one thing that's been interesting to us, so one of the most you know, commonly requested features um, for us has been function calling. Yep. Basically, yep. this is a feature that OpenAI has had a while for a while, but it's been a big gap in the open source community. And function calling, you can think about the motivation here. Um, if, you're just, if you're building a chatbot, then you ask a question to the LLM, and the response is going to be text. You're having a conversation. But there are, going, there are many applications where the output of the LLM is not going to be just read by a human. It's going to be used in the programmatically, right? Maybe consumed by another LLM. Maybe it's used in some back-end logic and some, uh, you know, powering some product. And if you are, if, you know, if the output of your LLM is being used programmatically, you often want it to be more structured. And that could mean maybe you want it to sort of have a JSON format so you can, you can parse it more easily. Maybe you want it to have, um, to call a specific function and say what the arguments to that function are, like calling some external API. And so function calling is, is essentially a feature that allows these you know, LLMs to return more structured outputs that can be used programmatically. And um, you know, we released, so this is something that uh, as part of our LLM endpoint product, we released function calling, which was a big gap in the open source um, you know, AI ecosystem. And that you know, quickly became uh, super widely used. And one of the highlights there is we, we experimented with function calling, enabling function calling for a huge variety of models, you know, the Llama models, Mistral, and so on. The highlight was that um, the, seven, the small Mistral model, the 7 billion parameter model, actually did super well. So uh, not as well as GPT-4, but um, as well or maybe a little better than uh, GPT-3.5. So that was a very exciting for us. It, it, it's impressive. I mean, it's, it's the first thing it's given me, uh, like, ho like an inkling that, that the open source will, has a chance of catching up. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, you launched, I, I think uh, any, any scale launched uh, Mixtral support quite a while ago. Um, you must serve, and, by, and uh, I'll say this kind of un unbiased, even though I'm here, uh, that that any scale is actually quite quite uh, of all the endpoints we, we tested throughput speed is very impressive and what are the like best of the, of whatever of everything I've tested what um like what are the challenges of serving this and can someone do it themselves and like like is that biting off a lot and like what what's the yeah yeah I mean so that's a great question um, running these types of so you can definitely run it yourself, right? And there are actually a lot of cool projects that try to optimize for you know, even running these models on your laptop, right? And actually, there are, um, there are projects like Llama CPP, which get pretty good latency for, you know, at, very, at low, you know, very small batch sizes, like a batch size of one, but get good latency uh, just on your, on your laptop. So you can do that kind of stuff. Now, there are a lot of complexities with actually running these APIs. I think um, one of the challenges is trading off um, throughput and latency. And sometimes you can optimize for both, right? Sometimes you can get the both, best of both worlds. But just to give you one example, uh, there are techniques that we invest a lot of energy into, like speculative decoding, right? So actually, can you raise your hand if, you've, if you are familiar with speculative decoding? OK, so maybe it's not a super widely known technique. But um, this is. Well, maybe a little bit related to some techniques in, with um, um, you know, like compilers or, or CPUs use, which is um, as, you're, as a processor is executing instructions, sometimes it gets to an if statement. And you know, that if statement could evaluate to be true or false. Um, and it doesn't know yet which branch it's going to go down, but sometimes it can just guess which branch it's going to go down and start executing the subsequent instructions. Uh, and la later on, when it determines which branch to go down, if it guessed correctly, then it can just sort of skip ahead. Right? If it guessed incorrectly, then that extra work gets, gets thrown away. Right? It's roughly analogous with uh, speculative decoding 
in LLM. So decoding is the process of just generating all the output tokens. Um, the way this works is if you have a smaller LLM, like a faster LLM, sort of guess what the output tokens are going to be. Um, it's, you know, so normally with generating these output tokens, you generate them one at a time. It's sequential. But if you um, have a bunch of tokens, output tokens that you guessed, you can check them all in parallel, right? So you can actually um, parallelize that, that process of, of checking. And if you guessed correctly, then you can kind of skip ahead. Mm -hmm. And so you can really reduce latency this way. Um, of course, there's a lot of work in making the smaller model guess correctly, and, and you can imagine um, you know, how that goes. But this is a, a really important technique for reducing latency for LLMs. But you can imagine it potentially comes at the cost of, of throughput because it's, um, it, you know, it involves doing some extra computation. Right? So there are trade-offs like that. And maybe depending on the load on your service, you want to um, you know, decide whether you're optimizing for latency or throughput. And, and there are a lot of choices like that. Um, so there, there are many different subtleties that we could go into. Wow. Is speculative decoding something that you, you all have put together, or is it something that the, the mixtural you know, is part, part of the, um, the base model itself? Um, so it doesn't come with the base model. Yeah. We're actually uh, in the process of, so there are many, it's part of the underlying inference engine. So if you're familiar with inference engines like VLLM, is one from Berkeley. Uh, there's TensorRT LLM from NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other, other frameworks like this. And we're actually in the process of open sourcing some of this, this speculative decoding to, cool. and contributing that to the VLLM project. So, um, yeah. And in, in terms of um, the one question for, for those of the folks that were like, uh, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll get a server to run this on. Does 8 by 7B run on, is it, is it all multi-server? Is it any possibility of single server? Like, how much memory? Like, how, what, what, are, what are you getting into when you're trying to take on serving the, the, the probably the most comparable to GPT 3.5. Right. So, um, so these models are typically reported in terms of the number of parameters they have. Yeah. Right? So you hear about 7 billion parameter models or 70 billion parameter models. Um, the, the mixtral model is, is, I forget the exact number, 50 billion, 60 billion parameters, something like that. Now, when you think about, OK, how do I go from number of parameters to how much memory I need? Right? For, uh, these machine learning models, or for you know, LLMs, GPU memory is often the limiting factor, okay? So, or one of the limiting factors. You need a certain amount of memory just to hold the uh, model, the model weights in GPU memory, right? So, if I need, um, if I have, so, if, so uh, one parameter, that is like, um, say it's like 16 bits. Right, so 16 bits is so 16 bit float. That's two bytes. Yep. So you ba because it's one parameter is like two bytes, you need roughly double the number of, of so it's seven billion, you might need parameters, you might need 14 gigabytes of GPU yep. memory. Um, and so for this you know, 50 billion parameter model, you might need 100 gigabytes of GPU memory. So um, there, there's, there's a caveat asterisks on all of that. Yeah. But, um, it's a lot of these models, you know, are not going to fit. Some of the larger models are not going to fit in a single um, GPU memory. So you're often <laughs> splitting the model across multiple GPUs. Got it. And um, and actually, the you know, if you split it across more GPUs, you can, um, you know, again, you have latency versus throughput trade-offs there. Got it. Got it. So so it's uh, there's quite quite a bit of work if you really want to get the. Yeah. You can imagine if you're getting really fancy, um, depending on the load on the system. You may want, and the resources available, and the, you may want to, um, you know, split a single model over more GPUs mm -hmm. at a certain load, or fewer GPUs at a different load. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And, and then uh, for, for the mixture, mixture of expert models, is there any special sauce to fine tuning, or is fine tuning any, any, any more challenging, or is it exactly the same as, as maybe a traditional model? Um, it's a little more challenging. So in our experiments, we've done. Um, like LoRa fine tuning yeah. for the mixtral models, um, in particular, you know, uh, using these like adapters for these uh, low rank. So, actually, how many of you have heard of um, LoRa fine tuning? Okay, like a lot of people. Yeah. All right. Um, so LoRa is a you know stands for low rank adaptation. I think it's a technique for um, 
where instead of fine -tuning, doing full parameter fine tuning where you're uh, modifying every weight in the neural network, every parameter, instead you are, you know, you sort of have a compressed um, adapter that you, you know, add on to some of the weights to, um, it's both can be more efficient to train and it can all, but it, the real win is at um, inference time because you, because you have these adapters on top of the base model, you can actually serve, you know, you still run the base model and then you have, if you want to have a ton of different fine-tuned models, you just have a ton of these different adapters on top and you can kind of share, you can um, batch, you know, requests across for, um, um, multiple different fine-tuned models. Got it. So Definitely more challenging, it sounds like. It's, um, it's more challenging. Yep. Um, but, you know, so the, but it still works. Yep. <laughs> Got it. And um, th th do you support that today, or is it something that's coming out for any scale, for the endpoints? Um, we support it today for a lot of models, and, um, and, uh, and, but, you know, we're continually adding new models here. Got it. Um, I've noticed across the ecosystem uh, a number of different, you know, con context sizes, um, and specifically for, for even just a mixtural model. Um, is that, you know, is the one, you know, is the mistral endpoints different than the, what's an open source? Are you looking at, like, extension, extending the context window yourself? Like, what do you... Yeah. yeah. We actually, and this is, um, you know, I think one of the premises of this whole yeah. event, but if you're building AI applications, you are probably building a RAG application, because yeah. um, it's hard to imagine building an application without context. Yeah. And... Um, you know, if you're building one of these RAG applications, you probably care about context. You actually, how many of you have run into limitations of context lengths? Okay. Um, you know, context lengths are growing longer and longer, but there's still a lot of challenges, um, you know, with selectively choosing or retrieving the right context to feed into um, your LLM call. and you're, you know, ultimately, we're going to want to build applications that have kind of infinite context that can take advantage of all of the data you know you've ever seen, or that's out there on the internet, right? And so uh, that is necessarily going to be a RAG application. But um, being able to, the the more limited the context is, the less root margin of error you have. Um, in your retrieval, right? Yep. And right now, retrieval can actually be a big bottleneck for the accuracy of our applications. Like when we build LLM app applications, you know, you, you can sort of simplify it into a retrieval stage and a generation stage. And the bottleneck could be in either place, right? Maybe the generation quality is just low, is bad, and you need um, more fine tuning or you need a better, um, more powerful model. But a lot of the time, the bottleneck is on the retrieval step. You just didn't feed in the right context in the first place, and so there was no hope. And when that's the case, um, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into improving the retrieval side of the equation. Maybe, um, you know, maybe you need to chunk, you know, define the embeddings differently. Maybe you need to fine tune the embeddings or chunk your data differently. Um, or maybe you need to, and actually chunking the data correctly is like a, is an art, and there's a lot of work that goes into that. Or maybe you need to, you know, have another model kind of, um, after you retrieve a bunch of stuff, rank the different uh, pieces of context to feed in. So there's a tremendous amount of iteration that goes into that side of the equation. And, but you can imagine the longer your context is, the more um, room you have there. Yeah, and I, th <clears throat> I think the, um, you know, there's a bunch of teams, like un I think the unstructured people, unstructured IO people are here today, but help, help with like cleaning up the data on the ingest side, which is a, you know, half the battle of, of this. Um, and then, yeah, Colbert and, and different types of retrievers that, that are more, you know, more advanced in your simple retrieval are, are common. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of both, uh, let's first off, like, endpoint evaluations, for, like, but maybe let's not return, don't want to mix the terms too much, but um, I know you guys have put out some metrics on, on endpoints and trying, trying to help people understand what are the differences and, what, what do you think, are, like, what, what, do you, what do you put out there? What, what are some of the, the stuff that um, is important as teams are looking at, at testing? Yeah, so th that's a great question. One of the things we noticed, there are a number of different companies 
that host open source LLMs, right? And when you're evaluating, and there are many different choices you have, different providers, um, of course, different models, and you know, different. Um, so when you're building your application, there are different things you may care about. You may care about cost. You may care about of the LLM. You may care about latency of the LLM. Um, you know, you care about quality, but that's a function of which LLM you're using. Right? We find that typically the top priority for people is quality. Um, you have to the L, the application has to work. Yep. Right. Um, once you meet that threshold for working, uh, then the next consideration people care about is latency. Depends on the application, but. Uh, for many applications, latency is sort of a core part of the user experience. Right? Yep. So then latency comes second. And then after once, but that only matters to a point, right? And there's no need to make it infinitely fast. Yep. And then once you make, but once it's fast enough, then people care about cost. And um, I'll say that for some, some applications, cost comes earlier. But you can imagine. Um, especially for batch workloads where you're processing tons of data, like maybe I want to look at every web page on the world in the world and extract structured information from that, and there's just a you know just running on hundreds of millions or billions of pages or whatever, then cost really starts to matter. So, uh, but we see those uh, happening in those order, mm -hmm. that order, and when people measure things like latency or other performance metrics. It's important to make sure you're talking about the same thing because I may say you know the latency for this thing or the throughput is X tokens per second, um, and somebody that can mean a lot of different things, right? For instance, with LLM uh, performance, you often want to break things down into two steps. One is just how long does it take to generate the first token? Uh, so you know how uh, much, what's the latency, and that's a function of the number of input tokens. Mm -hmm. And then, how quickly can I generate output tokens? Right? And those, th those different numbers will depend on things like the typical um, input number, of to number of input tokens, the typical number of output tokens. And it also, you know, different providers may do things like caching common prompts and, and you know, caching things between queries. And so uh, you can speed things up in common cases. There are all sorts of decisions you can make there. But the point of, and other people have actually started publishing LLM performance benchmarks as well recently because it's just a useful thing to do. These are, you want to have comparisons across. Uh, so you, you can decide for my application, the typical patterns that I'm working with and the dimensions that I care about, whether it's cost or, or latency or other things, um, what are the best choices? Right. And uh, I know you have something to get to in a short bit, and maybe we'll get some other questions. but. Um, maybe there's the, the little bit of uh, opening eye drama today. I don't know if you heard Andre Kaprathi laughed. Any, any thoughts on, on that? Um, so, sorry to drop the, <laughs> the random question. Um, he, was, but he was building the Jarvis, like apparently the Jarvis with the agent yeah. stuff there. I, I don't think any of us have any other, other information. But yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. have any, yeah. any particular insight to, to add there, unfortunately. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I think he does great work. Yeah, he does great work. He's someone I follow closely, um, like both him and OpenAI a lot, so, yeah. um, as well as the other model providers, want to be even. Um, so any questions from, from the, the group out here? OK. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, the closed source providers from just training with the, you know, evaluation uh, materials because it's all public, right? So yep. I, there's nothing preventing me from ingesting the question and answer in there and, you know, oh, I get better results, you know? Uh, yes. That's something I was, yes. I hope it's not happening, but it could happen, you know, like, I don't know, Gemini, maybe? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> like, is there, like, a movement in the evaluation way, like, to make some sort of you know, unified evaluation that are, you know, not, yeah, know, some, without this problem. It, it's, it's like, that is such a good question. <laughs> I mean, it's, so the base of the question, if you, if, if you all didn't hear it, if you um, did catch it, is, is basically, um, how do we know our tests are good 
if the te you know one if the if the model is being trained in closed source because you don't know what the data it's being trained on is, it could include the test, which is the big worry. Um, and, and I think it could. I, I think the risk is too. Even if they don't purposely include it, you can it, tweets can include it or like like any data. It could be randomly on a website that that someone's talking about the answer to this. So it's very hard when you're training on the internet worth of data to know did I accidentally put the answer in. Um, and I think it's a big problem, and this is specific, specifically for model evals, which are trying to compare model, like this, how the model does in this task. Um, and and I, I kind of think my answer is, is, is that any, the, the value of an eval and a model eval declines exponentially as the days it's in the public. <laughs> it's kind of what it feels like to me. Like, like the first day I put it out, I feel good about what I have. And then I'm slightly worried that providers are actually you know, modifying and, go, and you know, doing something towards it. Th th there's been some really good write-ups where people have described the really good eval that, that, that you know, is constantly challenging the model and they can't like, but, but I, I'm, I, don't, I haven't seen one that exists yet. I, I worry everyone that we put out, we'll put these results out, but if we rerun it in a month or two, did a model provider you know, just train to, to do my test well? Um, so I, I, I think it's a challenge for the industry and it's a great question. Um, I, I, I also very suspicious, like the leaderboard evals, the well-known ones, um, MMLU, I'm going to talk a little bit about them. I, I don't trust them. Like, I, I don't trust any of them. <laughs> don't, like, One thing I would, <laughs> you know, add there is in some ways it's very different, but in some ways it's actually not that different from evaluating people. <laughs> if you think about um, standardized testing for humans, they come up with new tests every year, and you could imagine if you didn't do that if you just use the same tests every year, what kind of problems you would see. So um, I think you'll see some similarities in, in that dimension. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and, and the concern is it doesn't generalize, right? Like if it generalizes, then we're all good and you can, you can go use it. But um, if, if it's just trained to do well on the test, which we're worried about, that, that's the problem. Yeah. Maybe. All right, so there's some other hands in the back of the room. Did you? Oh, okay. Hello. So yeah. thank you so much for putting up this session. So you mentioned some decoding technique, right? So I want so instead of predicting one token, you'll be predicting multiple tokens, right? So how does you change like what is changing the architecture, and then how do you fine tune this model, this change architecture? Yeah. So that's a great question. So the overall technique I mentioned is called speculative decoding, right? and the idea is, you know, you have a LLM that normally generates one output token at a time sequentially, and if you can have a smaller model correctly guess some of the output tokens, um, like the first three output tokens in a row, what, well, it generates some predictions, and you can, in parallel, check that those predictions are correct, right? And maybe the first two are correct, and the third one is not correct. So if you guess two of them correctly, then um, you can output those two tokens and, and kind of skip ahead to generate from where you left off. So how does this change the model architecture? Um, th actually, you can do this with pretty much any LLM. You don't need to change anything about the model in order to do this, which is super cool. Now, it doesn't this mean it's easy an, to implement. Another model, I guess. Sorry? Uh, another small model, not a change in the original model, right? Yeah. Okay, I got it. No, no, you don't have to. You don't have to change the original model. You have to create the small model, yeah. right? Um, now, if you fine tune the original model, then you probably are going to need to modify the small model because the small model's predictions are not going to be accurate much yeah. of the time. And thank you. I would say, I, I think also like a lot of models use beam beam search. Like, it, there's quite a bit of things where it's not just one token at a time. Like most of them are built on on doing many many tokens at once. Uh, hey Rob, I have a very quick question. Uh, what uh, do you use, do you have your own data center or you just use cloud on, regarding the yeah. hardware? <laughs> uh, so we primarily use the clouds. Are you, you like is it confidential or like would you do, do you mind share like you use uh, Microsoft or you use AWS or or um, a hybrid? We use a variety of different providers, but um, a lot of you know a lot of AWS, a lot of you know, oh, yeah, GC, yeah. a lot of standard. Cloud providers, we use Lambda Labs. Um, right. 
or you only choose like GPU when you choose different like cloud services or you will consider other like I reuse all different instance types in fact a lot of the workloads that we our customers run uh -huh. um, you know use well, of course a lot of them use GPUs but a lot of them also use CPUs and right. just as an example say you want to you're building some big rag application you have a ton of data you want to Im compute embeddings for all of your data you know billions of vectors um, there's a big there's a a, a big GPU component to this, which is running the embedding model. Mm -hmm. There's also a big CPU component, which is loading the data, chunking the data, mm -hmm. pre-processing the data. Mm -hmm. um, and, or similarly with training, if you want, when you have something that's both GPU intensive and mm -hmm. data intensive, mm -hmm. you often need to offload the, the data part onto CPU machines because they're right. way cheaper. So yeah, this yeah. cloud company is more like your partners, right? So if I'm a user, I can choose, oh, I prefer to train my stuff like on AWS. So I can use AWS and you yeah. like. Kind yeah, of like that's, that's right. They're, the way our platform works is that uh, our customers, you know, if they want to run training workloads or s deploy models, they have the option to bring their, just to bring their own cloud accounts. Mm -hmm. And we can manage the model training and deployment inside of their cloud account, their AWS account, say. And that's advantageous in a lot of scenarios. It's you know, not always the thing you want to do, but if it, it is the thing a lot of businesses want to do because um, A, they have committed spending with these cloud providers. Like they've already you know, signed up to spend millions of dollars on AWS and they want to you know, use that spending. Uh, they also have negotiated you know, discounts with these different cloud providers and they want to take advantage of that. Um, right. So there are a lot of different reasons. Right. Thank you, because I work for AI chip company, so maybe you yeah. can talk more cool. there. And another factor is just, um, you know, in a lot of cases, it makes their life simpler if the data and the models and the code never leave their cloud account. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, real quick question, one for each of, you, each of you. Jason, outside of MMLU, what are other good, how, how should developers or thinkers or builders be thinking about evaluation? Uh, outside of maybe large language model uh, mm -hmm. evals, uh, specifically uh, like MMLU. And then Robert, in terms of MOE, do you see anyone fine tuning MOEs in, in your space? And if they are, is it early stage? Is it really tough? Do you see anyone doing that in the space? So one question for each, so. Yeah, uh, so, so, so what, what, are, what are good evals if I don't like the, the public ones? Uh, my, my recommendation for most teams is, is actually, um, is, is if you're in a business and you're building, you have some examples of what you're trying, of whatever task you're on. So, so I think the, your best eval is actually going to be internally some examples of what you wanted to do and, and build your own data set and test data set. I think that's like outside, and the, the model evals out there are going to help guide you to choose a model. My recommendation also there is start with the fastest and easiest and uh, most easy accessible one. A lot of times if you're in, you know, it's the cloud provider you're on, uh, <laughs> whatever deal they have. So. You know, Azure, it's going to be OpenAI, Google, Gemini, and, and AWS is typically Claude. Uh, and then use that one. Um, and, and, and so, so like, the, the model eval to choose your model, a lot of times you should just cho choose the best available to you and then see if it works on your data. Um, and then you start to build a, a, a little data set that's your own test set. I think it's the best because it represents your task. It represents what you want it to do. Um, you're not worrying about cheating tests, and in the end, that's what you got to use it in your, in your job to go do something. Yeah, you, just to emphasize that point, you have to do model evaluation in-house. Yeah. You, you can't outsource that part. And this is because it's very problem specific for the actual you know, task you're trying to accomplish. And you need to really get into the details, like look at the data, look at the specific examples, look at the failure modes, and, and there's going to be a lot of iteration uh, based on that. Um, yeah, for the question you asked me about fine-tuning mixture of experts, we do, like, we are fine-tuning, like, Mixtral. Uh, we, our customers are fine-tuning Mixtral. And I think in general, you know, um, mixture of expert models are, I think, are here to stay. And they're going to be, uh, model customization is just going to be uh, used across the board for, well, for all, for all models, basically. I think there's, um, you know, fundamentally people are going to want to, improve quality for their specific applications. And you have a couple different knobs for improving quality, and one of them is, is fine tuning. Is there any learnings from fine tuning MOE versus like the benchmark? Like, are they different or is it the same? I think the, um, 
I think the biggest difference with, so we've only really done like LoRa fine tuning for, uh, for Mixtral, but there are big differences between full parameter fine tuning and LoRa fine tuning. Um, certainly can be easier to get uh, full parameter fine tuning working. And for things that are, um, especially for like, if you have a lot of data that you need to use and take advantage of, um, then you're often going to, you know, if it's starting, if you have so much data that you're fine tuning on, that it starts to look more like pre-training, then um, you know you're better off using full parameter fine tuning. Um, I think one of the big advantages, you know, in my mind, the big advantage of LoRa fine tuning is when you need to um, serve a bunch of fine-tuned models, you know, and you want to, you need to do that in a cost-efficient way. Uh, also, sorry, if you have more questions about fine tuning, Karosh over there is, is uh, the best person to you should find him. Awesome. Uh, I was curious, in such a like GPU constrained world now, where like getting access to compute is difficult, people like Sam Altman are trying to gather together seven trillion to write <laughs> build AI chip foundries and things of that nature. I think one of the cool things with uh, any scale is that. It's meant to be sort of, you can deploy it on heterogeneous resources, sort of like uh, different clusters or different instances of compute. So how are you guys thinking about serving really large models, like 70 billion parameter models, potentially 100 plus billion parameter models, uh, by taking advantage of whatever limited compute is available? And are you guys thinking about any interesting innovations or, or say, sort of technologies in that space as well? Yeah, I think there's a lot of, you know, both current stuff we're doing and future stuff we plan to do. But if you think about, um, say, cost efficiency for LLM serving, LLM inference, you have to really think about it holistically, like many different layers of the tech stack, okay? So there's everything from just, um, where you get GPUs and how much you're paying for them, right? There's things like, can you take advantage of, um, you know, different clouds, different regions within those clouds to just take advantage of the cheapest GPU, right? Can you take advantage of, uh, to the extent that there is a spot market, can you take advantage of the spot market for uh, instances? Um, now, slightly higher levels, like um, you have, you know, many different models you're serving probably. Right? Some are getting high traffic, some are getting low traffic, right? Can you, um, can you, make can you sort of swap for the high traffic models, can you auto scale the number of replicas of the model up and down you know, rapidly to account for you know, variable demand, right? For the low traffic models, like can you multiplex the serving of many different models across um, you know, fewer GPUs, right? Um, there are things like, can you know? I mentioned techniques like speculative decoding, but there are many other techniques for also improving, improving throughput. Right? So techniques also like uh, continuous batching is a really important one. And as you, as your surface is under variable load, can you um, adjust whether you're optimizing for throughput or optimizing for latency based on that load? Right? There's and there are different choices that make sense at different, uh, different loads. Uh, there are things like, can you, um, as you're auto scaling, you know, you may need to load new models, say from S3 into GPU memory. Like, can you really optimize uh, the the auto scaling time? Right. That means is normally by default the thing you might do goes from S3 to into memory to disk, and then back into memory, and then into GPU memory. And can you just go straight, you know, pipeline it all the way through? Um, there are techniques like. At a, at a higher level, you know, you might be running your inference workloads for this inference service, but you might also have other, like, lower priority training jobs you're running and other, like, just internal R&D workloads you're running. Can you kind of multiplex these different workloads on the same pool of GPU resources? Or do you have, like, a dedicated pool of GPUs for serving and a dedicated pool of GPUs for, you know, training? And so there are um, many different things you can do. Um, you know, some of which we're doing, some of which we're going to do. 
Um, but you know, there's a lot of, you have to really think about it. And I'm, I'm not even, I didn't even mention all of the um, just like model and you know, GPU level optimizations here. Uh, there's a lot we do there as well. But there's a, a ton of depth here. Um, you guys talked about how you like serve a lot of different open source models. A lot of companies have been popping up that are like doing model routing and kind of optimizing for speed, performance, cost, all that. What are your thoughts on that? Would you get into that? Uh, we don't have a model routing product. Uh, I think a model router is a good idea in general. Like it's a, a useful thing. And um, you know, and some of these, like the Mar Martian is one of these companies, uh, and they have a leaderboard and you know. Um, we're one of the providers on, on their leaderboard. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we are, if you look at these different leaderboards, we're pretty competitive in, uh, in, in certain dimensions, right? Um, where, let's, yes, what do I think about it? What do I think about? <laughs> I mean, I guess a lot of them, what they do is route to different providers as well. So like any scale is an option, open AI is in there. But would you do routing between models and stuff too, or is that like not really on the radar? Um, I mean, it's something that's, useful for our customers, right? I think the, what, you know, at a high level, um, you want customers to be able to get, the, the first thing they care about is quality, typically. Um, I mentioned latency and cost, and with model routing, you can often get, um, you can do much better than the single best model, right? Because if you can determine that OpenAI is like really good at coding questions, and Anthropic is really good at, um, you know, language translation, and and you know, Mixtral is really good at something else. Um, you can get higher quality than any single model, and you can, you know, get lower cost than any single model. And so you, it's it's. Uh, I mean, model routing is an incredibly good idea. Cool. Yeah, I would Thanks. say, it's also, um, it adds complexity, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of thing that you don't want every company to have to solve for themselves. Got it, thanks. I have a question for Jason. Uh, mm -hmm. You said like your company does the observability. Mm -hmm. So are there any feedbacks or even in the observability framework, you have customer adoption metrics. Mm -hmm. um, it could be applicable to you too. Uh, in your customers, do you also get back on the application how much of it is adopted, how much of it is liked, and that kind of a metric. Is that flowing through in your system? It is, I mean, so, so we, we allow people to tag um, tag information, tag spans or inferences as, as they're collected, and or augment with like, uh, it could be thumbs up, or like, like human feedback um, post, uh, and, and lots of companies do, like, like human feedback on the experience, and whether they like it, and whether, uh, you know, it was a it was a um, a good a good experience or not, or a good generation or not is is a, co a common feedback. You just don't get that much of it. So, um, so p you do it. It's this gr great signal, great a good signal, good good metric. But you, you also, if if it's user supplied, you, you, there might not be that much of it. So, um, a lot of times we're using other metrics to to generate or value success or quality. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I would say we absolutely do. Customers use it all the time, um, and it's one layer of, of one thing you look at, typically. Thank you. I have a question for both of you. Yeah. Uh, what's the next step for your company, and let's say aside from models, um, do you guys would stick to the same business models, and, um, and as well as a competitive strategy? <laughs> yeah. God, Thank you. So, what's the next step for <laughs> for us? Yeah. Or, yeah. Both, both. You want to go first? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, I would say the the last year has been a, um, an, an incredible incredible year of kind of of, of new stuff coming to market, um, and from a product perspective, I feel like we're we're just catching up. So, there's a lot. That I want to that that's in the works so that we're rolling out that I would say helps so, so we, you know observability and valuation helps customers build um, helps that quality of what you build to turn from that 
nice Twitter demo that works great in Twitter, but, but you know, get to production that actually works is, is the hard part. Um, and some of that stuff is, is managing more complex interactions. So um, you know, you, we talked briefly about function calling, but, but as people try to do, put more complexity, function calling is one of those things you can do to, uh, to, to make your app or experience do more. Um, the other one is retrieval and making retrieval solid and good. Even that, you know, it feels, given the number of um, tech talks on retrieval, you think it's a solved problem. It's not. Uh, so, so I think there's a, I think there's a bunch of area. There's two main areas there, which is building better tools for people to evaluate um, and manage their their LLM apps and debug them in in, in ways. And so you're going to see an immense amount of product come out around that this year. Like stuff you haven't seen and stuff that's quite unique. Um, so that that's we're, we're focused on tools that help you build these LLM apps and and build them well. Yeah, for us, yeah. we're trying to make it easier for businesses to use AI, and we want companies to be able to build AI applications and you know get AI in production without having to think about the underlying infrastructure, distributed challenges, distributed systems challenges. Right? We don't want we want you to be able to get all the benefits of, say, training on a bunch of GPUs or deploying models, deploying LLMs, and so on. Uh, we don't want you to have to think about these kinds of like scaling or fault tolerance or GPU availability or how to use spot instances or you know how to make things cost efficient, how to make things reliable. Right. So our goal is to really take all of that work off the table, and to do that, there are two main dimensions we try to go deep on. One is just cost and performance, like really performance optimizations across the board, across the full stack. Um, and then the second dimension is just the developer experience, trying to make it a frictionless experience. Because distributed systems, you know, it's complicated. AI is complicated. It's a lot for people to learn. You can imagine a lot of knobs for people to tune and stuff like that. Uh, and that's just going to make people's lives harder. So we really try to uh, simplify things. Thank you. I appreciate uh, user <laughs> yeah. 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 Ye
wanted to mention one like upcoming event that we have. So oh, cool. we are hosting a boot camp, a two-day boot camp on building RAG applications. So this is like targeted at developers. It's hands-on. We are running, it's essentially like hands-on training for uh, a lot of best practices and advanced topics in building RAG applications. Um, this is happening in, oh. <laughs> <I like it. laughs> yeah, so this is happening in, in um, this is uh, just plugging an event that we are doing uh, in March. But this is, uh, you can imagine, advanced topics for retrieval or how to handle multimodal data or you know, how to improve quality for your embeddings, right? And, or how to think about eval. So there's a lot of uh, subtleties there. And this is an in-person event in San Francisco that we're running in, uh, in early March. So you can check that out. And um, we'll, we can send out more info about that later. But just wanted to, uh, to, to uh, mention that. It's also super relevant for if you're interested in long context. OK. Yeah. Oh, great. OK, that, that's all I wanted to share about that. Great. Um, well, 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 thank you, y'all. We, we have one more. So thanks, thanks Robert, for doing it. Um, so, so you saw the, all the green on Anthropic. What we have now is the actual results. So we'll, we got we're going to do a, a real good dive into um, uh, we're going to do a, like a, a fifteen to twenty minute dive into evals, which kind of brings takes Greg's original work and shows you kind of like a, a rigorous next step in, in a large comparison with mixture models with truly anthropic tests. So give us five minutes to set that up and we'll go through it. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Let's do one more before I lose everyone. Yeah. How's it going? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Yeah. Give, give me one minute. I just want to set up. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, there's another 15 minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> Give people a minute to there. I have a question. Uh, yeah, you have a, we're, we're going to finish up. I still want to go through this. Yeah. So. No, we have one more, one last so, presentation. Hey, how's it going? So we're gonna we're gonna do one more presentation for one last thing. this okay yeah it's, it's a little better it's just all right we're gonna do this one quick so if you all can grab a seat we're gonna finish uh five more minutes I'll, i promise i'll be fast through this all right one more pass through all right, everyone. All right. So, uh, so everything we've done to date 
and what we've gone through is actually pretty light. This is going to be, this is like the deep technical part of the talk. <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's, I promise I'll go fast through this. So, um, but, but we'll, we'll, I'll, um, I'll just hop in here. So, yeah. Hey, can we get everyone back in their seats and then get your food? And then can we get it a little quiet? Thanks. So, um, so first off, we, we put this out there. So, so a part of my team from Uber, ex Uber, put this out called model evals versus task task evals, um, and and they're, they're they're quite different. Does does anyone know what a model eval versus a task eval is? Any hand? I think there's one person in the room who knows this. Viva, Viva, and that, this is the guy who knows what he's doing too. Um, so so they're quite different. And, and the thing you're you're actually going to use if you if you use LLMs in production, you actually get there. You build your app, you're actually there. You don't really care about model evals, to be honest. So, let, let, like all the stuff we're going to tell you about here, um, probably doesn't matter that much. It's not that useful. What you're going to use in your job are task evals. First off, what's a model eval? Well, a model eval we were talking about earlier is ML MMLU. Um, it's a mixture of a lot of subjects. It's like all of you remember back to SATs and college tests. They're like college test questions. Um, but there's professional accounting. There's there's some pretty complex subjects which the model's got to get right. And then notice there's ground truth. So a model eval has ground truth in a question. What it's good for is um, is a leaderboard. So so you get you do well in your questions. You're graded. You get to the top spot. You get to the top spot. You get VC funding. So. <laughs> and, a, and, and a lot of it sometimes. So, so this is highly sought after, which also has the wrong incentives, right? Like we talked about, you know, uh, training to the test. Well, there's a huge incentive to train to the test because you make it to the top of this leaderboard, you're going to make a lot of money. So, um, so those, that, those are model evals. There's a question, a grade, um, and, and you can test your model. A task eval the other thing I wanted to show you is notice there's no prompt template, meaning there's no variables, prompt template variables here. A task eval, there's, there's, I don't know if you can see that, there's a prompt template with variables. And you're applying that template throughout your data. One eval might be, is there, is there user frustration in these conversations? Did the assistant hallucinate, which is one of the other evals. Um, so, so you're applying the same template to data, and this is what Every one of our customers uses in business uh, tasks. It's not the model eval. It's a template applied to their production data. So, and, and notice also there's no there's no ground there's no ground truth. You're just applying it, and it's telling you it is the ground truth. It's just, it's a proxy for success. Now, I just want to give you an example of what one of these task evals looks like. This is from Phoenix Open Source Library, completely open source, and it's a hallucination template. Um, we, can't, we can't evaluate hallucination on public facts, like is a model going to make up a fact on, say, Michael Jordan's birthday? We don't know. But when you're doing retrieval, you've, you've got your, your content, your, your reference data, you've got the, the generated answer. You can tell whether the, the model has made up the answer uh, from that data. So hallucination detection is possible on RAG applications. It's not possible in general. Um, so these evals are in a specific task, and and what you on on the right side you've got like what do task evals look like in Phoenix, which is our open source product. I'll, I'm just going to show you like a little bit of just make this the um, just make this more like like one little product view, just so you can actually see what this looks like. So so sometimes you'll. What you can see here is there's, there's some evals. So these are this, this is a RAG, RAG application um, tracked. I think I was using Llama Index. This is Phoenix, which is observability, showing you like the call trace of what your query hit, where it did the retrieval, um, and there's also evals associated with this. Um, so it shows kind of like the chunks chunks available. And just want to show you what a task eval looks like before hopping in any deeper. A task eval is just saying, you know, was it incorrect or correct from a Q&A perspective? And then the other thing we have in Phoenix we use a lot is explanations. If you're going to use task evals, 
use explanations. It's like my one little hint to like the industry hasn't figured it out. Everyone, every one of our customers is using this. It's a blueprint for what's wrong in your app. And, and it's a little flag in Phoenix that just says why it's wrong. So in this case, it hallucinated because the query asked for a question and, and basically it's not in the text. Um, so a little bit of like, okay, what's a task eval? What's a model eval? Um, let me go back because we're going to talk about model evals. Um, so, so model evals, task evals. What we've been talking about with Haystack, it's a model eval. It's looking at GPT-4 versus Anthropic. It's looking at Anthropic versus Mixtral, which I'll show you in a sec. So you're, tr you're trying to decide what model maybe to use in your business or what model works, you know, what, what's the best model out there? What, you know, what's the best model on the leaderboard? Um, but they're, they're great kind of little, they're great for understanding what, what's going on under the hood. Um, and, and as we talked about the retrieval stuff before, that Greg's amazing work to get this to work in the first place and get, get it out there. His, his first question was a question about San Francisco. You know, what's the best place to, you know, what's the best thing to do in San Francisco and have a sandwich in Dolores Park, which, um, which, which is great. Uh, but the problem is that question could be cached. So our first concern when we saw the question and, and the test was he was it was the same question was being asked every time, so a lot of caching occurs in retrieval in, in all these systems in OpenAI. So what we decided to do was add a random number, so to really test whether we could retrieve a fact in the context, we modified the test to make a random number. We also put it into the Phoenix library for evals, which is like 100 times faster than almost anything else on, on market. Um, and we also changed the city, so we're not just doing San Francisco now. Uh, the city actually randomly changes, so the question changes a little bit. Um, and so the goal is you do you, you put it at the top of the context, the bottom of the context. You also grow, you also grow the context. So that's kind of what we're doing. That that that's for what the haystack test is, and we're trying to understand. Um, again, the red dots are where it doesn't get that fact correct, um, and this is Claude versus GPT-4. So this is a repeat of Greg's experiment with more rigor, uh, a lot, you know, more rigor and kind of an exact test. Um, also found some more problems with Anthropic. Also got an email from Anthropic, um, and, uh, and, and and you know, Anthrop I, Anthropic's a, a solid model relative to a lot of stuff we see. So I don't want to be super negative on it, but they gave us some guidance, the same guidance they gave uh, Greg, which was. Add this, you know, add this little thing into the top to say like where, um, where you know, the most relevant sentence in the context, and, and this is an example of what what Claude gives you. So Claude is now pulling out the sentence first, and then it's generating the number from what it pulled out. So it's so it's kind of a hack, a little bit of a hack to like get it to retrieve this this sentence. I'm not, I mean, it's it's prompting, um, and, and then get to get to that that number. Uh, and it does work. You know, this, this was kind of prompting guidance on the right. It's better. It's still not as good as GPT-4, but it's, it's better. And then this is, this is the original Anthropic. Um, and I also want to do Mistral versus Mixtral. So there's, we talked about open source and open source models. Damn, that's, that's, that was good. We, we, when we saw it, Mixtral was impressive. Uh, and if this is the 8 by 7 b versus that just the normal 7B, that's kind of what you can run on your machine. This is the one we were talking about. It takes a little bit more than that. Um, but, but it's impressed us in, in, in every way for, for, for an open source model. So, so one more example here. Um, and then we decided, to do, we just put out something this week um, to get more complicated. So the GNRAG is generation. A lot of times I'm sticking a bunch of chunks and then I'm asking it to summarize. Or what are the four things I do? Or what are the... In this case, I want revenue numbers for an SEC filing, and I want to know the percent increase from revenue from year 1998 to 90, you know, 97 to 98. And so there's a generation task. You're asking it to do something cognitively at the end of finding that fact. So, we, so we're adding a little bit more to it. Um, in this case, you know, this example here, it's the, the generation is requiring it to number format, to round, and do division. And by the way, the, the, the arithmetic makes a big difference. So when it's strings, concatenations, even summarizations, very, very you know, decently easy, decently good results. The arithmetic at the end actually was interesting enough, um, caused a lot of the problems. 
Um, so the different types of generations we tested. So now, I'm now not only doing retrieval, I'm not only trying to find a fact, but I'm doing something with it as part of my generation phase. Um, we tested a mapping, we tested a modulo, a number, which some of the results are, are amazing. I, I don't have them here, um, which I have some, that, that is itself a whole presentation and fascinating story. Um, and then there's some, some other stuff, string concatenation and some arithmetic. Um, and, and our results were like shocking. Like it was the, I, I have ran hundreds, probably a thousand plus haystacks and tons of evaluations and like, I've never seen GPT-4 worse than Anthropic. So we saw that on like any test, on, on almost any test. So we ran this, we're like, what the hell's going on? What, what, is, what is up? And, um, and, and it kind of stumped us. And, and so for us, when we looked at the output, we noticed Anthropic was like, like the different, like this is GPT-4's response. This is a formatting of a, of a, of a date and a number, which is what the, the ask is. And by the way, this is the same answer for Anthropic but this is like, you know, we joke around, it's like you're talking to uncle. It's, it's just, it's, it explains everything always, no matter how much you put, like, give me just one answer. It's just, you got sentences and sentences. And we noticed like it kind of explained it and, and it would get it, get it right more than GPT-4. Um, so this was like a, a little thing we, we decided to do was like, why don't we just add one line to GPT-4 and just say, please explain yourself and answer the question and then answer the question. And, and it's like, perfect. Um, which is kind of mind blowing. It's also not a, like, please explain yourself and then answer the questions like a not a natural prompt iteration you do for RAG. Like, like it's not something I, I would think like to put there. Um, but, uh, but, it, but it, 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 to be honest, that helped to work through the math. So, the, so, so for arithmetic specifically generations or arithmetic work, Putting that in made a big difference. The string concatenation didn't really matter. String is great at. Summarization was pretty good at. So, so there's something about like this. I, I'm slightly suspicious too that like I don't know what these closed vendors do. Like, do they have like a math coprocessor? Do they like? Is there any like? I'm a little suspicious that there, there may be some something on the side doing math work, um, and, and as it generates it, it might it might be checking its answers. But um, that's a theory. I have no nothing no substance on it. Um, uh, the, the, the modulos, we did do some modulo tests, which were quite hard, and I'm, I'm quite surprised how well it did. But long story short, um, you know, gener gener these are still big differences in generation. And the last thing I would, I would note in just this view is Anthropics on the left here, it's pretty good below like 37 kilos. So pretty, you know, that's a pretty big, you know, miss the biggest mixture model is still not even 37K right now. I think context window size. I think you got 32K in their, their main API. So, um, you, know, it, you know, Anthropic does pretty good on, on you know, decently sized context. Um, and then this, is, this gives you an idea of what mixture looks like. And then, by the way, that little trick of, of please explain yourself also worked on mixture to improve the results a little bit. Um, so... Uh, so it gives you an idea of like RAG and then just think of you know, all these people telling you, talking about RAG and what to do with RAG. I mean, it, it, you are going to like these red dots mean like mistakes in the generation. Like, you know, you have this RAG app. These are your mistakes. Um, these are customer issues. So models do matter. Like, like I say, model evals don't matter. Well, they kind of, you know, you should, you should probably just do, hopefully you're doing some of this anyway. Um, but, but this hopefully... You do use some of these to actually make some decision, or hopefully you have access to these bigger, better models. As if you're doing rag apps, they're, they definitely makes definitely makes a difference. Um, I think that's kind of it. Um, yeah, so hopefully that, that that's th thank you all for for joining. And um, this is quite a bit of you know research effort we we have going on, and we'll have more. Just follow us on on Twitter or check out Phoenix. Thank you.